Welcome everybody to our uh, December edition of uh, Zoom Seekers. I have to, since this is our December edition, I have to start off by showing my my holiday shirt. I have to back up uh, a bit to do this. This is my um, I'm dreaming. Oops, let me get there. We go. I'm dreaming of a great white Christmas. That's I've got, cute. I've got about a dozen of these shirts, and and you know holiday themes. I've got Manta Claus and everything, and I can only wear them you know, a few days out of out of the year. So I figured I'd take advantage of that uh, now. Um, so what we're doing tonight, our original speaker was my friend Doug Sloss, who's out in uh, Colorado and became unavailable. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you're stuck with me now. But I thought we'd keep the same theme of, um, oh, and I'm going to do this. Uh, yes, there we go. Get rid of some of the extraneous noise there. Um, what, uh, I thought we'd keep the same theme, uh, a photo theme. And, and I freely admit this is a little bit, it's a little ham handed tonight because I'm going to work off of multiple, multiple screens. Um, but, but the idea is as, as the title of the talk, you probably saw in the, this week at Reef Seekers is how to make a good photo great. And I'm going to sort of break this into two sections. And the first section will sort of blast through fairly quickly. And the first section is actually a very truncated version of um, our photo workshop stuff. And we'll just go into some real quick elements of what you want to think about when you're taking a photo so you can get a good photo to start with. But then the meat of the program will be the second half or second two thirds, however long we take on the first part, um, which is what do you do with post-processing? And I will be the first to confess that any picture you've seen of mine where you went, wow, that's really good. Um, I've been, I've done stuff to it. Now, you know, can you take a crappy photo and make it into a great photo? No. Can you take, you know, a good photo and make it better? Yeah, you, you can. Because there's certain things you can do, either you didn't think of doing when you took the photo or you weren't able to do. I mean, one big thing we'll go into is white balance. And the fun thing is I'm going to show you two different um, programs. Um, that I use for photo uh, post-processing. And um, one is called uh, HP PhotoPrint, which was a free HP program that used to go with all the HP computers. And the good news on that one is, if you like it, it's small enough, I can send it to you and it's free. So I don't feel like, you know, I'm violating any, um, uh, you know, copyrights or anything like that. And and so we'll show you some um so things you can do in there. Uh, the downside of that program, and I'll try to remember to mention this again, is everything you do is what we the term we use is global. So whatever you do in terms of making a, I'm going to do some other stuff there. There we go. Making a change um, to anything, it does it to the entire picture. So like right now, you're looking at, at me on screen. There's some uh, photo program. You could just lighten or darken or whatever my face and do nothing else there. Not on this very simple program. Whatever you do to one thing, you do you do to everything. The other the other um, program we'll look at is a, uh, Adobe Lightroom. Not to be confused with Photoshop. Photoshop is a much more complex program, and I don't use Photoshop um, mainly because it it does a lot of things that I don't either need to do or don't do or whatever. Um, and what I, what I've heard people say is Lightroom is really good for photographers. Photoshop is really good for graphic designers because there's so many more different things you can do, but we'll, we'll show you some stuff and, um, I'll, I'll show you what my aha moment was, uh, when we were going into, uh, into, uh, Lightroom stuff. So, um, uh, so that's sort of the, the way this will all play out, play out tonight. Um, so let me get started by doing my share screen here and um, take a sip of water and um, we'll we'll get on our way about what, what does it take to make a, a, a good photo great. And I'll contend that the six shots you see up there are fairly decent, um, fairly decent photos. Um, and those are all taken by me. Um, and if anyone's wondering, we're not going to really talk about it tonight, except for that it's here. But I love my jellyfish shot there. That is taken from Jellyfish Lake, middle of the bottom row. 
and everyone goes, man, what's that behind? I'm shooting straight up. So those are actually clouds in the sky that uh, that you're seeing there. And that'll get to a, one of the themes that I will uh, get in a little bit about finding finding interesting angles to shoot. So let's start by talking about some of the mistakes you might make when you are shooting digitally. A lot of people just go blam, blam, blam. They just shoot, 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 and say, I'll figure it out later on. Well, you probably don't. So, you know, shoot the stuff you want to you want to shoot in a way that you can shoot it. Um, and a lot of other mistakes people make, they never look at what they, especially with digital camera, they don't look at what they're shooting. They don't take the picture and look at it and say, how can I make this better? Take it again. How can I make this better? Stuff like that. I'll fix it in post. Um, again, there's only so much you can do. So if I'm shooting a Gobi from 20 feet away, there is no way in hell I'm going to make that a good picture. Uh, sim simple as that. Um, but there are some things you can do in post-processing that will, will help. You don't fill the frame. You want to get in as close as you possibly can. You only shoot in JPEGs. Most cameras nowadays have the ability to shoot in a RAW file, and especially if you're going to go in and edit in um, uh, Lightroom or Photoshop or any of the more sophisticated post-processing programs, uh, you want to be able to shoot in RAW, not just JPEG. JPEG is a, a compressed version of, uh, of the image, so it throws out certain information. And you can still good, get good JPEGs, and you can you can tweak JPEGs, but you can't tweak them as well as you can with a RAW file because a RAW file has all the information. Basically, when you're when you're tweaking a RAW file, um, you're pretty much almost reshooting the picture, which you can't quite do with a JPEG. So RAW gives you a lot more a lot more leeway to make make corrections. And the corrections you can make are just in the way you shoot is shoot judiciously. You don't need to take a picture every single time and, and sort of think ahead. How do I want this thing? Do I see this fish? How do I want this to look? And what do I need to do to get it to look uh, that way? Um, now, there are sometimes where something's swimming by, shoot it now because it's going to be gone. That's a different, slightly different story. SRA, which I think is a patty uh, thing, but I agree with it. Shoot, review, adjust, take the shot, take a look. What do I need to adjust? Need to adjust my strobes, get closer, get lower, get higher, whatever the case might be. Usually with me, three is my magic number. I generally take three shots of everything. And usually the third shot is the one I will end up playing with. Um, and, and that'll, you know, get it here, get it better, get it better. So that that's it with me. Keep things simple. So I, I see a lot of people adjusting everything they got. The big things you got there are shutter speed, films, I still say film speed, ISO, and um, aperture. Um, and then on top of that, if you use a zoom lens, you've got zoom. The less things you have to adjust, the more likely you are going to get a good shot. I always, eh, almost always, shoot at one two hundredth of a second. I want to freeze everything as best I can because everything we're shooting is moving. I will set my ISO and leave it. Um, I'm going to shoot at 100, 200, whatever. I actually experimented on, uh, where was the last trip we took? Indonesia. And I said, I'm going to try to shoot at 1600. Because, you know, higher ISO means either you need less light. So you can use smaller apertures, which give you better depth of field, whatever. I've decided to experiment with 1600 ISO. I like the results um, as opposed to shooting at 200 ISO. So um, it, it experiment with stuff like that. If you have an older camera, I shoot with a Nikon D750. It's a 24 megapixel full frame camera. There are probably things I can do that if you have a smaller point and shoot type camera may not look as good, but experiment, see what's see what's what. And again, don't adjust too many things. Pretty much the only thing I adjust on any given shot, I will adjust the aperture because that will control what the background looks like. 
beyond the range of my flash. I will control my zoom. And I will sometimes tweak around with um, with the strength of my, my flashes. Flash, strobe, interchangeable word. So on my strobes, I can literally click, 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 click. I got a little adjustment that I can make them a third of a stop uh, brighter or, or less bright. Um, my buddy Mike Beach says, crop with your fins. In other words, don't take this shot. Kick in and get it that way. He'd rather see you crop with your fins. There's, there's a little bit of a reason to crop a little bit, but just remember too, even with digital shots, as we crop, what we effectively doing are blowing up the individual pixels and you start, the more you crop, the more resolution you start to lose and more sharpness you start to lose. Um, and as we mentioned, shoot both JPEG and, and RAW. Um, the most important numbers to remember, two. And I can't do one half with two hands. Whatever change you make, and we're always referring to the amount of light that's coming into your, your sensor, or if you still shoot film, your film is either going to double or have the amount of light coming in. If I change from 200 ISO to 400 ISO, I need half the amount of light at 400 that I do at 200. If I change my shutter speed from a 125th of a second to a 250th of a second, I need twice as much light as I did at 125. So everything doubles or halves. So again, this gets back to don't adjust too many things because you start multiplying things out. If you adjust one thing and then another two times two is four and just a third thing times two is eight, you may have just you know increased or decreased by a factor of eight the amount of light your picture needs. And you're going to wonder why is everything so dark or why is everything so light? That's just to remind you of two. Those are two, I can't remember what they're called, but the red sea fish. If you remember nothing else, these two things. Get lower and shoot up at an angle. One of my favorite shots, Red Sea. We'll talk about that one later because it's a crappy shot until I fixed it. But an upward angle just gives you a slightly different, different perspective on, on things. And get closer. Get as close as you can. This is one of our uh, sand tigers at the Aquarium of the Pacific, a uh, halibut of some sort, flat flatfish. And this is, you really can see that red tooth triggerfish really do have red teeth. But if you don't get close, you'll never see any of that. Get an interesting or unusual angles. I love what I call dead on head on. I want to face that animal directly head on. It's hard to do because most animals want to get you like this because they can see you out of this eye and they can see everything else out of that eye. So to me, dead on head on means the animal's willing to trust you. So this is a California sheephead at the underwater park. Hard to get him straight on. More eel, this is actually at the aquarium. So he wasn't going too far and he knows me. Whale shark from Isla Mahares. And my t-shirt nemesis down at Guadalupe. And, and to me, again, the reason I like head on, dead on, it's there's no question the animal's making contact with you. And I love shots where the animal's looking at the camera one way, one way or the other. Two of my favorite head on, dead ons. Does anyone know offhand what that is? It is the hardest animal I've ever had to shoot head on. If, and if you want to guess, just unmute yourself and say, because I can't really see all the, my, my, my share screen takes over my entire screen. Um, it is, and if you've done any Indo-Pacific dive and you've seen them, it's a fire dartfish. They're hard enough to shoot sideways. This guy let me go head on. And that whole streamer you see running up there, that's his, that's his elongated dorsal. That's a male, by the way. They have longer dorsal fins. The other one that I like is this. Anyone know what that is? You have to unmute. I'm not going to be able to hear you if you don't unmute. 
I saw Carol, leaf. your lips moved. It's a leaf, leaf fish. It's Bingo. It absolutely is. Leaf scorpion fish. I'm shooting him straight down because he's sitting in all of this staghorn coral. And so you could get that kind of an angle on him. And you could even get a head on dead on. And these are angles. I've, I've never been able to shoot these guys that way. If you guys have never seen a leaf scorpion fish, they generally are up against the side of a coral. They're on a wall or something like that. And you just don't get these kinds of angles. So anyhow, find unusual angles. Because the other cool thing then is when you decide this is what I like to shoot, you'll go look for that kind of a shot and you will find it. So anyhow, um, again, how do you get a good picture? Lens makes a big difference. Some of you have fixed lenses in a point and shoot. You're sort of stuck with that. Most point and shoot cameras now, and there are some great ones. Susie takes some great shots with that. Little, it's an Olympus, I think, that you have, Susie. Unmute. Mute. It's a TG4, go. so it's not even the latest on this. Yeah. yeah. Um, most of those now have zooms. Understand the difference between an optical zoom and a digital zoom. An optical zoom means the camera's actually zooming. A digital zoom just means it's blowing up pixels. So actually, you don't want you know, digital zoom. You see some of these cameras, 100 times zoom. And you'll see it has a double zoom and then a 50 digital zoom. Not, not that good. Um, I shoot with the DSLR, single lens, digital single lens reflex uh, camera. I use both fixed and zoom lenses. The big thing, if you're using a DSLR, find out what the closest focus is for whatever lens you want to use. A lens that closest focus is five feet underwater, not going to do you any good. You want something, I think, of my lenses. I think the furthest close focus is maybe 16 inches. And I got a couple of them that shoot down to about nine, nine inches or, or less. Um, and a lot, a lot of DSLRs use a wide angle fixed 20 millimeter or 105 macro. And as I said, you know, zoom, zoom lenses, the 28 to 105, my absolute favorite lens, because I can shoot relatively wide and I can zoom in at 105 and shoot shoot macro. Um, and you'll hear people say, don't use zoom lenses. You lose, you get vignetting or you get this at the corners. So here's just a quick example of some zoom, a, a zoom lens. This is my 28 to 105, Nikon 28 to 105. It's a lens they don't make anymore. And this is just an anemone and two clownfish in plow. I said 28. I'm not going to move an inch. I'm st saying exactly where I am. Same animals. And that's at 105. So you just get an idea of what the picture is. And the advantage here is, again, using Mike Feature's crop with your fins, you can also crop with your zoom. That is still a full resolution picture, just like the other one was. We mentioned shutter and aperture. You know, your shutter speeds, because everything's moving in the water, shoot as fast, fast as you can. The rule on land is one over your lens length. So if you're shooting a 100 millimeter lens, you want a shutter speed of at least one hundredth of a second. Underwater, uh, faster shutter speeds, I think, are, are better. But in general, you'll get a 30th to 250th to sync up with your strobes. As I mentioned, my, uh, my D750 does not go higher than one 200th synced up. So that's that's what I that's what I shoot at. Faster stops action. Now you can shoot at a slower speed and you'll get a little blur. And artistically, that may, may be something you're looking for. Uh aperture is the f-stop. And basically it is just an f-stop, it's it's a ratio, but it tells you how big is the lens opening. And a smaller number is a bigger opening, lets in more light. A bigger number is a smaller opening. The big thing with the aperture is you want to get the blue water background. Usually, sometimes you want the background dark, but usually we want a nice blue water background. So this is actually under the salt pier in Bonaire. This is uh, Mill Channel in uh, Yap. That is Guadalupe. Um, you want to try to get that blue water background. And what you want to do is meter the water first 
Because remember, your flash is only going to go five to 10 feet, 10 feet if you're lucky. Meter the water. So get the water set correctly, then leave the setting alone. You do that and you do that with, with your aperture. And unless you change position in terms of shooting more upward or less upward, don't touch anything. And then once you get the water set, now you use your flashes to alter how you're going to be seeing the, whatever you're shooting. There's a frogfish in Australia. I'm happy with the, the blue background that I got there, but I'm going to show you the sequence that it took me to get there. So this was my first attempt. And for what it's worth, I'm also shooting, as I recall, this animal was at an angle. I'm pretty much on my back shooting almost straight up. Um, but I thought the blue there was a little too dark. So then I'm I'm playing with my aperture. I'm playing with the flash because it's a very white frogfish. Hard to shoot that. I didn't like my framing there, but now I've got the blue a little bit better. But you can also see the difference. And again, remember, I'm shooting up. See the difference between the blue in the upper right-hand corner and the blue in the middle upper part. And that's just because of the angle of sky, you know, the amount of sky that I'm that I'm catching. And again, you can see the difference there. So this is the shoot review adjust thing. I shot, I looked, I shot, made a change, shot, I looked, I shot, I looked. I'm dialing down the flash so I don't overexpose the frogfish. And I think that's the final, the final uh shot we got. And if you want to see how we cheated on this. We had seen the frogfish on a dive previously, and we wanted to go back and shoot them again. So if you really look closely behind the frogfish, guys, see that little piece of pink? That is a chem light that we stuck on the backside of the coral so we could find where the frogfish was. So sometimes you, you do those little things too. Um, other considerations? Composition, you use what we call the rule of thirds. The idea being that you take a picture like this, you divide it into thirds, and in theory, the things of interest would be at the intersection of any of those thirds. So I've got the eye close. Yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect, but uh, the other thing to remember is that, and I always joke, if you're in Israel, it's going to be different, but the way our eyeballs work in Western countries. If we read, we start at the top of the page in the upper left-hand corner, go to the right, come over. So we're going right, uh, left to right, and we're going up to down. So your eye has a tendency to fall down to the right. So that if you're composing a picture, the strongest visual is something that starts your eyeball in the upper left and drags you down to the lower right. So you can see this frogfish, his tail starts in the upper left and draws us into his face, sort of lower-ish right. It's not a hard and fast rule, it's just something to be aware of. Um, understand what fish you're shooting. We talked about leaf scorpion fish, there's another one. Um, come on, come on, there you go. Working with the animals. Understand what the animal is doing. Here's a blue spotted ray that's eating that fish. So I don't want to spook him off the fish. I want to shoot the behavior. So I just moved carefully, tried not to get in front of him. Try, make, try to make sure he doesn't think I'm trying to steal his fish. My, my little things aren't sliding up like they're supposed to. Um, bracketing simply means take a couple of shots, either different flash strengths or different um apertures here's uh and, and these are nudibranch eggs here in california and i bracket it up to shoot a little brighter and you get a better shot and by bracketing all you're doing is taking a couple of shots and then again in the post processing you look and see which one which one looks the best luck plays a lot into getting a good shot pilot whales happen to, i happen to have the ponga drop me in the right place see a cortez this one is a little bit of luck, and I knew what I wanted. Luck is the manta ray being there. That's uh, two of my dive masters, Marilyn on the left, Betsy on the right. 
And I knew I wanted the animal. I could tell from the way he was swimming that he was going to block out the sun and I could get that angle. And I told motion to Marilyn and Betsy, keep going with them. And then I was kicking on my back and down, 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 and finally got the shot. This is definitely luck. Also, see a Cortez. These are mobile rays, and you can hear them coming. Literally, you hear that in the water. I looked and saw this school, and they're paralleling me. And dumb luck. They turned and faced me. I shot. They turned away and left. This is the only time they faced me head on. So sometimes luck plays plays a big role in, in all of this. But shoot, shoot, shoot. The more you shoot, the more you'll you'll see what you like, what you don't like. Stuff will get in. Now, again, here's shoot, 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 and luck. A pair of mating mandarin fish in yap. Not a bad shot. But when you keep shooting and luck comes into play, then you get a shot with the actual eggs dropping from the female right before they get dispersed into the water column. So absolute pure luck that I didn't know until I, I looked at the shots. But again, after you're done, you're not really done. So this is where we're going to get into the post-processing. And we're going to do some actual live post-processing here. But you know your work is sort of just beginning. Just so you know, not that you have to do what I do, but those of you who traveled with me before have seen this. End of every day, I download everything I shot that day to my laptop. I look at every single shot. I average 150 shots a dive. I look at every single shot. Anything I sort of like, I throw in a folder, make a copy. Never destroy your originals. You never work on an original. Make a copy, work on the copy. Um, I throw anything that looks reasonable into a folder called to be tweaked. Then later on that evening, I'll sit down and I usually pick out 10 shots every day because I'll post those on Facebook. So I'll take 10 shots. I'll definitely post, but you just start tweaking through stuff. Now, at some point you'll go, I've got 50 turtle shots. I think I've got enough, but this is how, you know, this is how I work, work through stuff. And I use the term tweaking. To mean any adjustment you make to the picture could be a crop and that's all you do you might crop it you might brighten it you might contract you might do a million things to it tweaking is just my overall word for what are you going to do to make the picture presentable so tweaking includes cropping resizing and, and by the way that's two different things cropping is going to be what do you want the ratio to be resizing and you'll see this in the first, uh, the, the HP program. Resizing is, well, how many pixels wide and tall do you want this to be? Do you want this to be 300 by 500? Do you want it to be 900 by 1500? Those are all the same ratios. So that's resizing. You can adjust the contrast and the brightness. And your best friend is a histogram. Um, as I mentioned, you want to know if you're shooting in raw or JPEG. So here's just a, a shot of a um a puffer, a nice little guinea fowl puffer. This is the HP program. So hopefully at this point, as you guys may or may not know, make sure that the share screen is as big on your computer as you can get it. Um if you cursor over on your computer, cursor over to the right side of where the share screen is, and you should get two little white lines and you can drag stuff left or right, drag it to the right, it'll make it as big as it possibly can. But some of the stuff on your computer screens may be small. So this is the screen of the HP free program. And these are the things that normally we can do there. We can adjust the exposure, we can play with the color. We'll talk about the histogram in a minute. You can adjust the sharpness. Scaling is the same as size. That's pixels. This particular one I have sized at 1,500 wide, 1,000 tall. Um, and you can rotate the picture around. 
So we will get into this program and actually play with stuff. But the histogram, and histograms are also in Lightroom as well. A histogram is essentially a picture of all the dark and light pixels in your photograph and everything in between. Dark is on the left, light is on the right. And if you remember the bell curve from when we were in school, you know, the bell curve was when you took a test, most people would fall in that middle area. What you'd like is some sort of a bell curve. This is a bell curve that's a little bit shaded to the right. And I don't remember what picture it was, but it, it may be just fine. Don't worry about the stuff below units, red, green, blue. Not that relevant right now. So here's a picture of just some little um, uh, little sea fern. I think this is a California shot, a little dark. So I was able to brighten it up. And you can see now this is the one I did this in the HP program. So here it was in here. And the way I'm going to brighten this up is with the exposure sliders that are in the upper upper left. Right there. And you can do whites, middle, and darks. Again, remember, it's global stuff. So all I did was make a couple of slider adjustments. And boom, that's how it changed. Now look at the histograms. That's the original histogram on the left. That's the adjusted histogram on the right. You can see how everything has slid to the right. And that's what the actual pictures with the respective histograms look like. So the other thing to know about the histogram is, so it's dark, left, white, right, and zero at the bottom and 100% at the top. So the vertical height of the histogram gives you a relative idea of how many pixels are in that particular color. So on the left-hand side, just looking at the histogram, you can see we had a lot of stuff on the dark side and a lot of it. And you look at the picture and it's dark. You look at the histogram on the right and you can see, well, that's better balanced out and there are not as many extremes. And you look at the actual picture and it's a better balance. This is what the program looks like in Lightroom. There's a lot more stuff. Don't worry too much about the left-hand side. But anytime you're making adjustments in Lightroom, when you're cropping, it'll give you the rule of thirds comes into play. Down the right-hand side, you can see we have a histogram. We have various sliders to deal with tone, to deal with um, light and bright. There's a bunch of different stuff you can do here, as well as a lot more that I will show you when we play with the actual program that are below where you see at the bottom of the screen, it says highlights, lights, dark shadows. There's a lot of stuff below there too. You can control individual colors. You can control the individual color in saturation, hue, and luminance. There's a bunch of stuff you can do here that you absolutely can't do. And the other thing you can do in Lightroom, but you can do it even better in Photoshop, is if I just wanted to adjust the eye of the fish, I could do that, or just adjust the mouth. You can really narrowed down what it is what it is you want to do. And this is just some examples of pictures that have been tweaked to acceptable levels. I like shark shots, as you can probably tell. Um, so what I thought we would do is give you some real, that's, by the way, the world's best turtle shot in the cocoa. It's got him looking right at me. The way I did it, he, he hung with me for half an hour. When I say work with the animals, I don't know why. He just liked me. He would sit in my hand and I would just toss him up and he'd float back down to my hand. And while he's floating back down, I would take his picture. So um, let the fun begin. We're going to uh, do some real world tweaking. I'm going to stop that share while I'm thinking of it. Are there any questions from anybody at the moment? I'm taking the dead silence to be a no. All right, let's keep going. Um, let me get back to that. All right. 
I need to go share. Whoops. All right, we're going to start with the HP program. I've preloaded um, stuff in there. I realize this is why I want you to have your screens as big as you can. This stuff will get bigger. But I've taken, these are the shots I actually shot. And I'm going to show you what I did with them. I think I can do this. So what you do when you go into this program is you double click on the actual image, make it bigger. And with this guy, all I wanted to do was crop him. And what I will do is I generally put everything at a 16-9 ratio. 16-9 ratio is your HD television and probably the computer screen you're on. If you're on an older computer, it's 4-3. So here's one cool thing you can do with, with this. So here's the way I would do this in this HP very simple program. I'm going to crop them down there. Crop them up a little bit. I can move them around. I can move that around if I want to center them up a little bit better. And let's say I know that's that's sort of the upper and lower that I want. And I want this to be HD is 1920 by 1080. 1920 pixels wide, 1080 pixels high. So what I'm going to do is take the scaling. And I'm going to make that. 1920. Oops, I did that wrong. I need to make the upper one. Sorry. Because I've set the top and bottom. 1080. It's telling me now that this is 2359 wide. I hope you can see that. I know it turns out real small. I'm just going to slide this over. I'm, I'm looking at the number. I'm trying to get to 1920. And when I hit 1920, I got 1921 close enough. I know that this box is now the right size. Obviously, this isn't the way I'd want to do it. So I just take the box, move it around a little bit, and say, okay, that's that. I hit accept, and that would be that would be the picture. Um, I don't think I can take that. Maybe I can do it. This. Let me try one thing, see if this works. Uh, no, it doesn't it just works on my computer, but not on that. All right, let me do that. So here's another one. And I'm going to show you this is without explaining this too much. I'm just going to show you what I would do on this one. Again, this HP program is real good for fairly simple fixes. So the first thing I'm going to do is crop this guy down. This is an arrow crab sitting in front of an anemone. I like that size. I'm going to do my 1080. First thing I always do is crop. Get this down to 1920. That's close enough. Get that centered around. Now to my eye, that's a little bright. So I'm going to start with the mid-tones. And the first thing I do is ramp it up too high. Bring them down. I'll do the dark tones. Brighten up a little bit. I'll sort of keep an eye on the histogram. A lot of the stuff you see over here on the histogram is from the white anemone. But I would go, okay, that's acceptable. And so even with me explaining, that took less than a minute. So the idea, one of my ex-girlfriends used to spend, I mean, like 15 minutes per shot. And just sort of sort of nuts. Here's another one where this is an uh, elegant dark fish from the Maldives. All I want to do really is I'm too far away. So I'm just going to, even though I said crop with your fins, I'm going to crop them down like that. 1080. Oops. 1920, reposition the box, and he's good to go. So a lot of times when you're just making these very simple cropping adjustments, you, you can do them pretty quickly. 
and again, pretty simply, I mean, the thing here is where we talk about start with a halfway decent picture. You know, these pictures are acceptable. This is a, um, oh, what's it called? It's a blank file fish. I love these guys. I can't remember the first part. Anyhow. Um, and with this one, I might want to do a little color. Correction there. You could even with the color wheel. Change the coloring. So sometimes when stuff's too far away, like the background will appear too green. If you don't throw enough light on something underwater, it'll appear green. So you can do something like this to get rid of that green cast. So that gives you just a quick idea of, of those four. I'm going to stop the share, and, and I think I think this will work. I do this this way. Uh, where did it go? Yes. So, does that give me? Ah, hang on. I got to do this a different way. the way okay i think this will work all right so here's here's the pictures we just looked at that's what we ended up with that's what it started as that's what we ended up with that's what it started as that's what we ended up with that's what it started as so you can make decent pictures out of stuff that maybe started out not as good. But let's get over to, uh, I think this is where I want to be. Okay. This is Lightroom. I've preloaded six pictures into Lightroom. And I need to move you guys. Uh, hang on one second. Uh, my thumbnail. There we go. I've got you guys, you're all displaying over the controls on the right, and I can't see anything. Okay, in Lightroom, what you're going to do is I'm going to start with the whale shark photo. That's not the one I want. I want that one. All right. The biggest frustration I ever had shooting whale sharks, any other kind of shark, manta rays, anything with a white belly, is it's really hard to get white. And the reason I ended up getting Lightroom, I was on a trip to Guadalupe, and I'm looking at my blue belly sharks, and, and, and I got some really great shots of sharks with bluish bellies. And I just happened to be standing next to this gal who had Lightroom. And she's talking with someone else and she's da da la da la. And she goes over to here and right there. And hopefully you can, if I get in real close, I can read the label on that. It says white balance selector. It's an eyedropper. And to me, this is like the greatest thing in, in Lightroom. I click on that. I take any part of this area that I think is white. And when I click the eyedropper, I'm saying to the program, make this white and relative to that white, adjust all the other colors around it. So keep a good eye on that shark. And I'm going to click them in three, two, one, click. And to me, that's just an amazing adjustment. Now what I'm going to do and we'll do this a couple of times. The way I do my workflow in Lightroom is the first thing I do is I work up in here in the tone area and I take the highlights and I'll slide them back and forth. And you can see as I'm sliding the bubbles, everything there is way overexposed. I usually kick the highlights almost all the way down. Now I'll come down 
for this area here where it says tone curve. And I usually start with the darks. And I'm trying to get a little type of contrast. Then I'll go to shadows. I may come back up to darks. I may adjust stuff. So I'm getting sort of trying to get sort of a balance among everything. And I do most of my light, dark, and shadow work. Whoops, down here, I just kick the shadows up. But you can see that shadows, eliminating the shadows, real dark. So you can really play with how the contrast is. Now you come back up here. And even though it says shadows and everything, it deals with them differently. So I may kick it down a bit. And if I want to change the vibrance, so here you can see it's making the water really, really, really blue, but you may also notice it's making the spots on the whale shark red. You can play with vibrance, you can play with saturation. The other thing you can do here, they told you I can control individual colors. One thing you can do with the hue, Notice I'm, I can play with the watercolor, and all that's changing is the watercolor. So where I said on the HP program, everything is global, this you get a lot more control over it. By the way, a magic trick to learn, it's uh, the way you do it on a, uh, a PC. If you make a change and you hate it, so I just ramp the blue all the way up and ugh, I don't want the water to be purple. An easy way to undo is control Z takes you right back to where you were. Undoes the last correction. The other thing I can do here if I wanted to, I can do detail. So I can get a little outline of the shark. Sharpen up the edges a little bit. If I wanted to, I'm not going to play with it too much. I can do lens correction stuff. Depending on if you think you're getting a little distortion or anything in your in your lenses. You can also do um, various transformations, vertical, horizontal. Rotate stuff around. So there's a lot of things you can do. There we go. With um, with Lightroom, and eventually I would go. I'm done. I accept that, and off we go. So let's take another shot. This is a shot from East Limahares, and it just looks a little washed out to me. I really like the composition. I like the background. So the very first thing I do is I'm going to crop. So I click up here to crop. And I'm going to do 16.9. These are preset uh, aspect ratios. And now I can slide the picture around. I'm going to bump it like that. I'm going to come back down to the highlights. I want to highlight it. Do I want to? Sometimes what I find is with the highlights, and if you watch the histogram, you can see the histogram sort of stretching out a little bit. On this one, I'm going to leave the highlights just right where they are. But I'm going to play with the darks. I'm going to play with the shadows. I'm trying to get a little contrast here. But now what's going to really help this is I'm brightening it up with the lights there. Now I'm going to come back up to the highlights and pop those down a little bit. I'm playing with the shadows now. Watch the area low right. And I can decide it's not really affecting too much except that. So I'd like to see some of that reef. I generally don't play with the whites which makes everything too bright. And I generally don't play with the blacks, or if I do, it's going to be very small adjustments. And then looking at it, I'm going like, you know, I got a little too much 
blue on the top. So I come back to the crop and I'm going to crop it just a little bit tighter. And then I'm looking at the composition and I'm cutting off the C fan. So I'm going to kick it a little bit that way, which also gets rid of that edge there. The other cool thing you can do in Lightroom, let's say I left it like that and I go done. And I go, well, you know, I really don't like seeing that little piece of the reef. I can come up here and use the spot removal tool, slide it over the offending portion, and you're going to see this disappear. And boom, it's gone. Now, I didn't do a good job because you see there's a little artifact shadow there, but you can you can play with that kind of stuff. Anyhow, looking at that now, look at the histogram, relatively balanced out. If I wanted to brighten this up a little bit, I can do it up there. I'm just, if you can see where my cursor is, I'm just grabbing the middle of this to brighten it up. But to me, that made it into a better, a better shot. I've got a manta ray here, probably from Socorro, too dark. So again, start with the crop. I want them 16.9. 16.9 doesn't work for everybody. Sometimes I'll leave them square. I'll leave them like that. There's no real highlights that I'm really going to worry about, but usually I'll check them. That's going to be the first thing. But you can see as I got the highlights up there and down, you can see what kind of separation we get up in this area between his uh, cephalic lobes and the water. So where I'm really gonna work is down here. I need to brighten this up. Oh, I, oops, I forgot. I need to make his belly white, so I've grabbed the eyedropper. There we go, now we got something to work with. I'm gonna get the bright, the, the darks up there. I'm gonna give him a little bit of contrast, come back and play with his shadowing a little bit. Look at the highlights. Now, one thing you may notice, if you look closely here, I've got a red spot that's backscatter. And when you do this stuff, there's another little backscatter there, backscatter there, that's what all these dots are. You can drive yourself crazy, but I can go back to the spot removal tool, get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And what this does is it finds a similar place in the picture to replace the color with. So you can drive yourself nuts. Photoshop has a much better spot removal tool. I just try to remove the obvious ones. The problem is once you start doing one, you go, oh my God, let me do that one. Oh my God, let me do that one. Oh, let me, let me do that one. So other than this red spot right there, not too shabby. Um, I've got a turtle here. Not a great shot, but this shows you how you can sometimes save the not great shots. I'm going to start up here in the histogram and I'm going to brighten them up a little bit, see where we are. And I'm going to go, okay, I can make that into something halfway decent. Take my crop. I'm going to make them 16.9. I don't always start with top to bottom. On this guy, let's start a little bit left to right. And that to me looks okay. But I also know that that's not the right color for the turtle. I know that he's got white areas in here. And again, in Lightroom, I can zoom in, take my eyedropper. Let's call that white. Zoom back out. But now there are other things I want to adjust in the lights and the darks. So we'd maybe darken that up a little bit. And you're going to get, one of the problems is you keep making these adjustments. You're going to get a lot of, you're going to get, see more and more of the back scatter. But I want to show you what the difference. So here's the highlights at zero. Here we are way too high, but here's zero. And maybe I want to take the highlight down a bit. And I can compensate by brightening everything up. By taking the highlight down, I start to pick up a lot. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I pick up a lot more detail 
down here. Notice how that starts to get blown out. So a lot of times on these highlights, I will knock them way down because you pick up detail. The downside is you knock them down too far. And as you brighten up the picture, you then start to pick up other stuff you don't want to see. So there's a lot of stuff to balance out. That's where I say Lightroom. You can do a lot more in Lightroom um, than you can in other areas. If we wanted to play with some of the coloration here, I could change the color of the water. Now I'm on saturation. I could make it a more saturated blue. Maybe I change a little bit of the green on his shell. And sometimes you just got to play with sliders to see where the changes are. I can't really... I can sort of see them on mine. I don't think you can see them on yours. So anyhow, and then uh, the other thing I do on most of these is I go down to the sharpening. And by taking the masking and I'm pushing my Alt key and by sliding the masking over, this tells, this shows me that's going to sharpen everything. This shows me where the edges are that I would be sharpening because you can over sharpen a picture and we'd have that. Um, two to go. And then we'll uh, do a bunch of Q and A. This is the shot that got me sold on the eyedropper. So you can see right here that that's one of the cages, Guadalupe. There's a nice shark shot. So first of all, we're too far away. So despite Mike Beach's wonderful admonition, we're going to crop, not with our fins, but with Lightroom. And I'm going to crop them in about like that. And now I'm going to take the eyedropper and change this blue belly shark into a great white. But what's the problem there? Whoa. He's way too hot. So let's get rid of the highlights. Let's get rid of lights there. Lights there. Because the other problem with a lot of this stuff is sometimes when you do these, You got to find the right blue for the water. I'm not doing a good job on this one because I'm trying to do them quick. But I'll show you how this thing turned out before. And I think also I need to adjust them up here. So when you do the, um, when you're doing the, the white dropper, it's adjusting the temperature and the tint up here. You can see as I take it back down here, we're picking up more of that, that blue. I'm not doing a good job on this one, um, but I will show you how this ended ended up, and it's a it's a pretty decent shot. This shot ends up being you saw this shot already. This is an example of good intention and a horrible result, and it's salvageable. So look at the histogram; everything is kicked over to the right. So the first thing we're going to do, I mean, this is the perfect example of a blown out picture. We're going to get down on the nose. And we're going to bring this guy in a little bit. Drop these guys down. Maybe bring this in a little more to lose some of the back dorsal. All right, so we're going to start with that. We're going to get the highlights down but we're going to take the exposure way down. And all of a sudden, this has got a little bit of life to it. Play with the contrast. Let's see what happens when we take our white balance. And I don't know how you can read that. It says, can't set the white balance there. It's too close to white. Pick something else. So let's pick something else. Same there. What it's basically telling me is, You've sort of got this the right color. So I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Um, 
play now down here with our darks. Play with our shadowing, maybe brighten them up a little bit. Look at the shadowing up here. Give me a little definition between the animals. I might want to blue up the water a little bit. The other thing you can do is just play with the luminance of the water. And sometimes you got to see where where the various shades are. And then I'd want to sharpen this guy. So again, I'm going to use the mask and just sharpen the outlines. And given what we started with, that ain't a bad ain't a bad shot. I might adjust a little bit, push them a little bit that way. But not too shabby. So to give you an idea of those, bear with me. Uh, all right, coming back. Wait a minute, where's there's zoom? Okie doke. So here's. Here's that shark shot. Here's my better correction of it. I'm hoping you're all going, ooh, because that ain't bad. Especially when you realize that's what you that's what you started with. There's the um Isla Mahari shot. That's what we started with. Cropped and brightened up the colors. There's the tur oh, I just had the one turtle shot. There's the um shark shot, a little tighter. I cut out that top pilot fish. That's what I started with. And there's the mandaray shot. And the whale shark, not cropped at all, just color stuff. So the point of all of this is start with a halfway decent shot. And with either one of these programs, and I really do use them, I use Lightroom all the time. I, I still use, if I need to do a quick adjustment or something like that, I'll use the HP program. But as you learn to use these and use the various tools within the programs, you absolutely can take a good shot and make it into a great shot and probably do it better than you would have ever been able to do it in the camera. So if anyone wants a copy of the HP program, it's about 10 megabytes, I can email that to you. Just shoot me a note and I'll send them out tomorrow with instructions on how to load it in. It only works on PCs, it will not work on a Mac. I'm happy to send it to you if it's on my, but I don't think it's going to work unless you have a program within your Mac that allows you to run PC uh, programs. Um, but I encourage you to take, you know, stuff you thought was, gee, not all that good or whatever, and play with them and see what you get. And um, off you go. So that's our pitch. We have a thing from Carol. I've used a piece of freeware called Fast Tone Viewer for years. Does all the basic adjustments as well as good red eye removal and lossless crops. So that's a good one too. Who's got questions? This is the moderated q and I moderate myself now. I answered every one of your questions or, or I just gave you so much information overload that you're going, I'm too polite to say, what the fuck were you talking about? I have hey, Ken, this is Sharon. I, okay. I have a question. All right, fire away. Sorry. Uh, okay, I'll go first. Um, yeah. When you're looking at your photo, you, the picture you just took underwater, do you ever look at the histogram or you just look at the, the you know, the, the you mean the, the actually underwater? I rarely yeah. look at the histogram. The other problem you have is depending on how you have your camera set. Well, the way my camera set, 
things look brighter in my camera than they actually will be once I throw them on the real histogram. But the other problem gets to be that if I have the histogram, I mean, let's face it, if you look at everybody here, no offense, but no one's a spring chicken on this call. So, you know, it's that kind of thing with the stuff. If I throw up the histogram on the back of my camera, um, the picture becomes very small. The histogram, I mean, I get so much information. It's all very small. So I pretty much just trust what it looks like in my viewfinder, you know, on the back. And then I deal with the histogram later on. I mean, you'll, you'll see if something's phenomenally dark or something like that. And if you're going to make an error, you'd rather have it be a little too dark than a little bit too light. Cause at some point you've blown out all the information. It's like looking at just your image right now, Sharon, the white light in the upper corner on your ceiling be yeah. very hard to get detail back in that. Cause you know, all the information is, is blown out. So okay. All right. That's who it. else got yeah, a question? It's hard, it's hard to see. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. I was Hi, gonna... Ken. Sorry, hey, Bromley. Yeah. Have at it. God, St Stephen was ahead of me. Okay. Uh, hey, Stephen, right. have at it. Okay. Um, I was just interested because you've taken photographs all around the world. Uh, do you have anything specific, you know, any tips for specifically for Californian diving and Californian photograph taking and the kind yeah. of conditions? Yeah. Leave your foot, leave your camera on the boat. That's <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Uh, it's very hard to shoot in California, relatively speaking. Um, you know, the, the biggest problem, I mean, the, the other thing is to, when you go down to really look at the conditions, it's like, I, I'm trying to think how to say this without tr sounding too arrogant. I'm, I'm a decent shooter in California because I hate shooting the really wide, wide, wide angle shots, blue water, background, all that stuff, you know, with diver in the back. Those are very hard to shoot in California. The stuff I like to shoot close up and macro, I can get away with in California because I'm not too worried about green water, not too worried about visibility. But, you know, the thing to do really, and it applies to anywhere you're going to go shoot, is when you jump in the water, take a good assessment of the conditions. If there's a lot of particulate in the water, like when we were in Bonaire in May, there was a decent amount of particulate in the water. So I knew that I was going to get back scattering shots or I've got to set my strobes a little differently, stuff like that. So some of it is, you know, jump in, let's say we go to the underwater park and we know the visibility is not going to be great. So if we're shooting giant sea bass, gee, can you get them in an area where there's kelp right behind them and you won't really see that much of a background, you know, and it won't be that big, big of a deal. So some of it is that, that kind of a thing. And just realize you're going to have some limitations in California that you may not have elsewhere. And you sort of adapt your shooting techniques to that, if that makes sense. Yeah, cool. Okay. Thanks. Or you do what you do and you paint a painting of it the way you think it is. And it doesn't matter what the real condition was. Yeah, that's one good thing about painting. That's true. You can just make it perfect. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Bromley, what you got? Hi, Ken. Yeah, I don't know if you played with the filters in the latest version of Lightroom, but the background subject separation is absolutely amazing. It'll pull a subject out from a really complex background. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. And, and the short answer to that is no, I haven't. And the reason is I don't like the word cheap. I like the word frugal. So what I've got, is Lightroom 6, which when it came out was a standalone version of Lightroom mm -hmm. that I think cost me 80 to 100 bucks. What I'm guessing you have now is the cloud-based subscription Lightroom, which is 10 bucks a month, which offends me greatly. <laughs> um, and you're absolutely right. The problem is I don't get any of those mm -hmm. updates and stuff stuff like that. And my understanding is they've added more Photoshop like things like in Photoshop, you can do really, like you said, just pull out a, a subject and really separate them from the background and adjust whatever you want much, much harder to do in Lightroom. So part of that is because you, you know, my mantra, diving is an expensive adventure sport that attracts the cheapest sons of bitches in the world. And I'm guilty of that in spades. 
when it comes to stuff like that because it just I don't want to pay 120 bucks for a photo editing program that I use, you know, a dozen times a year. That's just me. Yeah, I, I mean, my view is underwater photography is not a cheap hobby to start with. That's true. <laughs> that is true. It's like people say, "Well, would you ever upgrade your camera?" Because the thing I would move up to would be like a D800 or 850 or something like that, 48 megapixels. So then you go, well, yeah, the camera, I'm not sure what they are now. Let's say $3,000 or so for the body. But then the problem is that uh, then you have to buy new housing. So I'm a fan of the Light housing. So I've, I've always enjoyed those. Um, so that's another $1,500, $2,000 in that range. If you want to get an aluminum housing, you're probably dealing three or $4,000. Ken, let, let me shock. Yeah, let me shock you there. Yeah. So, Na Naughty Cam, I bought my housing for three eight. It's now five and a half. <laughs> oh. oh, I mean, the other problem is, uh, and which camera do you have in it, Bromley? Uh, I've got the D five hundred. With these cameras that are now the forty eight megapixels, and there's only a couple of them. Other than the files are just huge. I mean, my my raw files are generally twenty five to thirty megabytes you know which is enormous but you get these huge files in these 48 um megapixel cameras well now the problem is that you're seeing such detail in the image you suddenly realize how crappy your lenses are and you see the flaws <clears throat> in your lenses with nikon they make a whole separate grade of lens it's a professional called i don't remember what it's called but it's like a pro series lens that each of the lenses is about another two or three thousand dollars so all of a sudden it's like do you want to upgrade your camera yeah sure let me just spend twenty thousand yeah. dollars and then the question is are, are you ever going to make that back or not and much as much as i enjoy doing these kinds of things and sharing my photos with all of you uh, i'm not making 20 grand off of them so mm -hmm. that's one of the other that's one of the other problems yeah one of the things that I've taken into consideration is, you know, sooner or later, you are going to flood it, lose it, do something. I will feel a lot less badly losing a $700 camera than a $7,000 camera. Absolutely. Absolutely right. I mean, it's it's like I say, it's <clears throat> not when you flood your camera or if you flood your camera, but when it's you when. flood it. And the great example was mm -hmm. my, you know, my beloved D750. I got it whatever year it, it was. And we were on a, a Yap and Palau combo trip, shot with it in Yap, and th was delighted with what I was getting. This is the first full frame camera that I'd I'd had. I'd, I'd shot previously with a uh, D two hundred. I've always been a Nikon. You know, you know, for those of you who don't shoot uh, digital, you're either a Nikon person or a Canon person, one or, one or the other. And you generally don't switch because you've got so many different lenses and this, that, and the other that are specific to the brand, you know, and they're both, they're both great. But anyhow, so I shoot in Yap. I'm just delighted. We go to Palau, we do a day in Palau and we do the next day we're diving in uh blue hole and going to swim down to a uh, blue corner. And I have flooded in my lifetime three or four, three or four cameras and strobes. And every single time, and those of you who dive with me sometimes know you come up with me and you'll ask me a question while I'm doing something with the camera. And I try to politely say, I'm not talking to you until I'm done with this. Because every time I flooded anything, it's because I got distracted. And sure enough, I was doing something on the boat here and I get in the water and the dive blue hole, you go in at five feet deep and straight down through a literally a hole, and you're gonna drop down into this 90 foot deep cavern. And I'm looking and I'm trying to figure out why is there a little water bubble on top of my uh, little top viewfinder? And then I realize, oh shit, that's not a water bubble. That's an air bubble because the rest of the housing is filled with water. I have not been in the water more than 60 seconds and I'd forgotten to put an O-ring on the camera and went back and just went right back, handed it up. I knew it was toast, handed it, handed it back up to the guy. And as he takes it out of the water, he goes, no, Ken, look, it'll be good. The water's all draining out. Go, no, 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 no. <laughs> Go back down on the dive. And of course, everybody's going, where's your camera? And I just go like that. This was the advantage of the old Nikonis cameras. 
the Nikonis cameras, and I flooded one of those too, but the Nikonis cameras, I won't say they were designed to be flooded, but if you took a Nikonis camera, the electronics were in the top of the camera. So that if the camera flooded, it had a little time to fill up before you really, you know, got into got into all, all the stuff at the top. And you sometimes could save, you know, save those. But with the digital cameras, the first one I flooded, I think was a D200. And I took it into Nikon and they said, you know, we won't even touch them for the most part. And they said, the reason is there's just so much electronics now buried inside these cameras. We could maybe get it working, but in a month, the salt water we didn't know was deep inside the area we can't get to will corrode stuff enough and the camera stops working that we don't we won't we won't mess with it. And so sometimes it's actually cheaper to just buy the new camera than it is to to try to repair it. Along those lines, be aware you can buy camera insurance. Um, it's not necessarily cheap, but sometimes you know worth worth thinking about. Read read the various stuff. I I usually get my cameras at Sammy's. These are the commercial for Sammy's in LA. And I go out to the Pasadena store because they have a, a pro division out there. And one of our divers happens to work there. And the, the first time I got the D750 uh, that I did not buy the insurance for, um, he said, you know, do you want to buy the insurance? He said, all that happens is that you ruin the camera, you bring it back to us, we give you a new one. And I said, his name is also Ken. I said, Ken, you know what I do? And he says, come here, let me show you this. And he walks me over this little thing they have, and they've got a D750 that is melted. And I said, what the hell happened there? He said, it's a guy who goes and shoots lava in volcanoes, and he slipped. And the camera went into the lava and melted. And he pulled it oh, out gosh. by the tripod, brought it back, and they handed him a new camera. So the insurance sometimes is worth that. Just to well, I had experience with Sammy's about 15 years ago where I flooded a camera. I had their insurance, and they put me on the phone with some guy somewhere who was like, but why did you you flood your camera? Because I was diving with it in a housing you people sold me. He goes, but why why did you get your camera wet? I go, what were you doing with your camera in the water? I was scuba diving. He goes, you were seriously scuba diving? Yeah. Eventually I got yeah. my camera replaced, but it was quite a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's like, you know, sometimes you know, you'll you'll see these things. Um they're like basically baggies you can put your camera in, and you know, uh you'll go. Well, but I flooded the camera in that. And, and the answer from the manufacturer will usually be, well, why did you take it deeper than 10 feet? These aren't good uh, deeper than, so, you know, you never, you never know. But again, remember, it's not if, but when you flood the camera. So it is what it is. Any other questions or anything from anybody? No? All righty. Fair, fair enough. So I, th thank you, Lamar. Lamar is leading the silent applause. Um, I thank you for your rapt attention. If uh, if you do want a copy of, uh, like I said, of the HP program, shoot me an email. I'll send it out to you um, tomorrow, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be good good to go. And you can play with it. And if you have any questions, let Lamar unmuted. Yes, uh, it's about midnight. I I'm about to turn into a pumpkin. I was so going to say Lamar's in Atlanta, Atlanta area in Georgia. So. Um, so yeah, we're good to go. Oh, and now my phone's ringing too. Anyhow, let's uh, wrap this up and um, hang on a second. I'm wrapping up Zoom Seekers. I'll call you right back. Um, we'll wrap this up. I'll remind you, uh, well, I'll tell you, first of all, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year, whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate. Um, so this is our last one for this year. Uh, this weekend, I'll be posting the full schedule for the Zoom Seekers speakers for next year, which will include Stephen Holman in April, I think it is Stephen or something like that. I think it's uh, June. Wait. No, it I is got, April. Yeah, I got my list yeah, right yeah. here. Yes. No, you're in May. Night. You're May okay. 9th. But okay. anyhow, our next one will be um, Tuesday, January 10th. It'll be Brett Eldridge, and he is a wreck diver 
who will be, and, and he uses like this cool side scan sonar and photo arrays to like map out wrecks and stuff like that. A lot of the wrecks are deeper than we're probably going to die, but it's an interesting technology. And so that's what's going to kick off the new year. So with that, I will say thank you so much for joining us for our last of 2022 Zoom seekers. Hopefully it's been a good year and every year with COVID and everything else, we keep saying, well, next year's got to be better. So we'll hope 2023 has got to be a little bit better. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you all very much for spending some time with us tonight. And uh, happy new year eventually, everybody. And we will see you again soon.